Good morning. As we begin worship today, please hear these words from the book of Psalms. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may, may be known upon earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere him. Let us worship God. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise the Lord. Let us worship.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into this place of worship seeking you, desiring to spend time with you. Lord, we lift our hearts in prayer and song because you are worthy of that and so much more. Take this time that we're giving God and use it to teach us and to shape us, to make us more like you so that we may let your light shine through us to the world around us. And we pray now as your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. We welcome you to First Baptist Church this morning. We're glad that you're here, especially those who may be guests with us. Let's take a moment and greet one another in the name of Christ. hear a call to prayer this morning. This is the good news that we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. We pray and profess now our faith. Would you join me in unison as we pray? 
Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. Pray with me. Oh God, a few moments ago we shared together in the beautiful praises of a classic confession of our faith. That down across the centuries, our brothers and sisters in Christ, that great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us, have affirmed and confessed and sought to live by. And we pray now that as we come to this time of prayer and this time of worship, that we would take these phrases and make them more than just the things that we say, but rather we would embrace them as the great truths of our faith, that we might dedicate ourselves to them and that we might proclaim in the world in which we live the message of hope, the message of forgiveness, the message of transformation, the message of renewal that is conveyed to us through what you have done for us in and through our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. 
And we pray that as a congregation, not only in the, the confessing of our faith to one another, but in the confession of that faith as we bear witness in the world with the words that we say, the deeds that we perform, the actions that we express ourselves in, and the way that we relate to the hurting and the needy, the suffering, the brokenness of the world in which we live, that the truth of who you are and of your creative and redemptive love would show forth in our lives in such ways that we might be strengthened, that in ourselves that we might be comforted and renewed, but even more so, that through the power of your presence in our lives, that we might provide a message of comfort and renewal and grace and forgiveness and love and transformation in the world. Because of Christ, we pray. Amen. Pray with me, church family. Father, we're here to praise you and give honor to your name. But as we recognize you are holy, we see the depth of our unholiness. Forgive us, Father, when we do not put you first. Forgive us when we let stuff take your place. <coughs> Father, forgive us when we use your name without honor, without the honor you deserve. Father, give us, forgive us when we use your day that doesn't bring you honor and glory. Father, forgive us when we disrespect those who have been placed in authority over us. Forgive our murderous and adulterous thoughts. Forgive our lying and stealing. Forgive our comparing of what others possess with our own possessions. Our guilt is dark and will not come clean by anything other than your precious blood and mercy. And we plead for it now. Father, out of obedience, love, reverence, we bring our tithes and offerings to you knowing that you will multiply them to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
remain standing for the reading of God's word this morning. This morning's scripture text comes from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before his shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Ashdod, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. 
Suppose someone walked up to you this week, handed you a Bible, and said, tell me how I can become a follower of Jesus. What would you do with that? They might ask it in different ways. They may say, how can I be saved? Or tell me what the Bible says about God. That happened with Philip. Philip was an early deacon of the church. And the scripture says that Philip was told by an angel, go down to a road into the wilderness. And there he saw an Ethiopian who was over the queen's treasury. And he had gone to Jerusalem to worship, but he did not understand it all. And he had gotten a copy of the scroll of Isaiah, and he was reading it. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and listen and join along with him. And Philip said, do you get what you're reading? Do you understand what God is saying in God's word? And the Ethiopian says, how can I do that unless someone explains it to me? And scripture says that Philip began to speak. And starting with the scripture that the Ethiopian was reading, he proclaimed to him the good news of Jesus Christ. Could you do that? If someone were interested in the scripture, could you share with them about our Lord Jesus Christ? TV shows don't usually treat Christians in the faith all that well. They uh, kind of make us look a little strange sometimes, don't they? I was watching a show called The Brave this week, though. It's about a SEAL team, and one of the characters is named Preach because of his faith in Christ. He wears a cross. There was a guy there that was being held captive because he had done some bad things, and Preach was reading the Bible, and this guy began to talk to him about salvation. And Preach said to him this, he said, this isn't just about getting a ticket into heaven. This book tells you about how to have abundant life here and now. I think they got it right that time. That scripture exists for us to show us God's grace and God's love. This is what scripture says of itself. When Paul writes to Timothy in the book of 2 Timothy in the third chapter in the 16th verse, he says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. The Bible is given to us so that we might know how to live and that we might know how to share Christ. Be biblical when you share your faith. We have been talking about sharing our faith over the last few weeks. And today we look at why it's important to know about Scripture. If someone were to ask you to show them in Scripture how they may know Christ, what would you do? Well, let's look at that this morning. We're going to actually use our Bibles. So take the Pew Bible in front of you, or if you brought your Bible, look at it for just a moment. Just get it out. The first thing you might tell them about the Bible is that this is a love letter. This book is about God's great overflowing love and God trying to reach us through that love. It is a book that records all of God's efforts to bring us back to God's self. You might want to look at some of the overarching themes. If you flip over about three pages you will find a table of context. Now, I know that when you were in school, they taught you that's a good place to look and see what's going to be in the book, right? And you will see that the Bible has two great parts. The word Bible literally means book. It is a book of books. And there are many books, but they are gathered into two great sections, what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. As we look at the Old Testament, it is a look at God's work through the people of Israel. You see, as you look into this book, you will see in Genesis that God, out of God's overflowing love, created all that there is and created humanity. And then when we failed, God began to try to reach back to us to restore that relationship. 
And what God did, as we look into the book of Genesis, is God came to a man named Abram and called him Abraham and set a covenant with this person and with all of Abram's descendants. That God would bless them so that they might be a blessing and share God's great love to all the people. If you look on down through the book of Exodus, you'll find that great story of God and God's love and grace reaching down and restoring God's people out of the land of Egypt. You will find in the first five books of the Bible that God is telling God's story by giving us instructions, the law, and how to live. As you go on over, you'll find that the people said, but that's not enough. We need someone to tell us. We need a king. And God said, you don't really want a king. You don't want that much government. But they said, yeah, we do. And so God gave them kings. And then God had to send prophets because the kings didn't always get it right and the people didn't get it right. And God sent prophet after prophet to try to bring the people back to God. And the prophet said that one day there would be a Messiah. And that brings us to the second great section of Scripture, what we call the New Testament. The New Testament is a story of Jesus and of the church. If you're going to show someone in Scripture about these great themes, you might just show them that the first four books we call the Gospels, which means good news. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the story of Jesus. And then you can show them that in Acts, when Jesus has ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it is a story of the church that continues the ministry of Christ. And then you can show them the letters of Paul and other epistles, and you can show them that the church doesn't always get it right either. That sometimes we too need instruction, and these are books for our instruction of how to be church, how to be loving towards one another, and how to live together. And then in the great revelation, it is a story of Christ's return when redemption will come and all will be restored to God's people. It is a book that begins with the grace of God and creation and ends with God's great return. If you're going to share through Scripture, you need to make sure that this book first speaks to you. If someone were to come to you and say, show me in Scripture about Jesus, they might also ask you this question. They might ask you this. They might say, so what does that Bible mean to you? Do you use it? I mean, this is the best-selling, least-read book of all times. We talk about the Bible and it being holy, but do we open it? Do we know what's in it? Do we study it? Why do Baptists especially, but most all churches, put so much into Sunday school? We promote Sunday school at our church. We encourage you to come. It's because that is where we come together and we study God's Word. Yes, it's a small group where we get to know each other, where we have fellowship with one another, where we keep up with each other, where we minister to each other. But the most important thing we do is open the Word of God. Is the Bible your inspiration for life? Is it where you look for the answers to life? Now, I'm not saying that you will understand everything there is to Scripture. But do you understand enough to know how to share your faith, for your faith to make a difference? Scripture is important in my life, in the life of my family. I'll never forget when my Mima, my mother's mother, was in the hospital, and I went and I visited with her. She was facing surgery, and she said, Nelson, recite the 23rd Psalm with me. I had to remember, can I do that? Do I know it? Do I have it memorized? And luckily there's a Gideon's Bible right there in the hospital. But we read that and recited it together. What about you? Do you have verses that strengthen your life? Do you remember in Romans where it says there is absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of God? I cling to to that one many days. What about scripture from what we call the Old Testament? My mother, when she was alive, always used Micah 6, 8 as her verse for living. 
is etched on her tombstone. And it says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Scripture is filled with verses that can help us in life, help us to know what to do and what not to do. So if you're going to pick up this book and you're going to show others how to find Christ, you need to let it be alive to you. And then as you begin to share, you might want to have a theme. What are some ways that you can share through Scripture your faith? Well, one of the easy ways is just to find a good story. And by the way, there are a lot of those in the Bible. Look with me at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. If you're showing someone scripture, you can say, open it to the middle and you'll usually find Psalms. And if you go on over into the Bible, you'll find the New Testament. And then you'll find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a wise person. He was a teacher. And yet he knew something was missing in his life. He knew a lot, but something gnawed at him. And when he heard Jesus teach, he thought, perhaps there's something I need to know more. And so he went to Jesus at night and he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is where we get the wonderful verse that most of us have memorized. John chapter 3, verse 16. Since most of you have a pew Bible, let's read it in the New International Version. I know you probably memorized it in King James a long time ago. But let's read this together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. As you read on through that, Jesus tells this great teacher, what you really need is to be born again. It's to be born from above. Something must shift. Something must change in your life. You must literally let yourself be recreated by God. That's a good story, isn't it? That's one that if someone came and said, show me something that tells me how I might be a Christian, just read with them John chapter 3, and they'll know John 3, 16 probably, and explain that story to them. You might also look over into Romans. Many of you have learned what we call the Romans Road Salvation. Some versions of this are very long and some are shorter. I've broken it down for you this morning into what I was taught and what's been around for a while, and that's our problem, God's solution. Our response, God's assurance. Four things that you can remember. So if you were to take Scripture and turn over to Romans, you might start in Romans 3, chapter 3, verse 23. Find Romans you're already in John. Keep going on over into the Scripture. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is our problem? Our problem is that we are sinners. Our problem is that our relationship with God has been broken because we have fallen. We have disobeyed God. Most everyone who is living will confess that they have messed up somewhere. We all know that something's wrong, that we have not always gotten it right. Sin literally means missing the mark. It means as if someone were shooting at a target with an arrow and it just missed it. That's sin. That what God wanted for us is not what we have done. It's not how we have lived. And then if you flip on over with them to Romans chapter 6. In verse 23. 
you will find this. For the wages of sin is death. What does death mean? It means eternal separation from God. It means that without God, our lives are void or empty. It is not what we want. It means there's a gulf between us and God, and something is missing. But if you keep reading in this verse, it says, But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the great bridge verse that bridges our problem of sin and death and judgment over into God's great solution. This gift of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Flip back with me one other chapter to Romans now chapter 5 verse 8. Paul writes But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You'll probably need to explain to whoever you're speaking with what the cross means. Why did Jesus die? You might need to explain to them that Jesus was a son of God who came and lived a blameless, sinless life. And yet we are sinners and Christ chose to die in our place so that we might have eternal life. But God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Jesus, who is the very Son of God, shows us God's love and God's great desire to be in right relationship with us, that he would lay down his very life for us. And then if you continue on in what we call the Romans Road, flip over to Romans chapter 10. Our response will be needed. Romans 10, beginning with verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. At some point when you're sharing with someone about Christ, you ask for a response. You explain to them that God's great gift must be accepted. Have you ever had a gift that you didn't open, you just kind of left it there? (laughs) It might look pretty, but how do you know what's in there? You don't know until you open that gift. Jesus is the greatest gift for all of us. And we must believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. We must give our lives over to Christ and accept that gift and confess that with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. You know, there's a difference between just saying something and actually believing it, isn't it? I mean, there's a chair over here I sit in every Sunday, and I think that chair is going to hold me up. But it's not until I go and actually sit down in it that I trust that chair, that I know what it will do for me. So as you share these passages from the book of Romans, you might say to them, Would you like to profess Christ as your Lord and Savior? Would you take this great gift? Then you can take the Romans road that we've been talking about, and you can lead them through a prayer. It can be the exact same thing we've been talking about, our need. Help them to pray for forgiveness for sin, God's solution. Ask them to accept this great gift. In our response, have them confess Christ as their Lord. And then when they do that, go on over in the book of Romans to the 10th chapter, if you'll follow along with me again. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Excuse me. I need to go on over verses... Go on down to verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Isn't this wonderful to know that if we call on Jesus, we will be saved? That is God's assurance for us. So this morning we come and we ask ourselves, do we who proclaim the name of Christ trust the scriptures enough to share them with others? You might say, well, Pastor, you, you, you know, you're a preacher. And you know that question I asked you that if someone came and handed you a Bible and, and said, show me how to find Jesus? I bet you most of you would say, tell you what, let's call Nelson. <laughs> let's call Larry. Let's call Melissa. Let's call Justin. Let's call James. Let's call one of those guys that does this for a living. But if they are with you, they are wanting you to share you don't have to know everything, and you probably already know enough. George Beverly Shea, that great singer that was part of the Billy Graham Evangelism Society, said this. He said, there are many things in the Bible I do not understand, but the parts I do understand have changed my life. You don't have to get it all. You just need to know enough, and it will change your life. But don't stop there. Just because you will never understand it all doesn't mean you don't need to keep learning. You're not going to get everything there is in Scripture in one sitting. I mean, imagine if you went to lunch today and you sat down after eating your fill, you got up and said, that was good, that's enough. I don't think I need any more for the rest of my life. What would happen to you? Why, you would starve eventually, would you not? We have to take nourishment again and again and again. And so it is with the Word of God that we need to again go to God's Word and learn more and more and more. Do you open God's Word each and every day. The psalmist says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Is God's word deep within you so that it affects your life, that you live a different kind of life? This morning we're talking about sharing our faith and using scripture to do that. Last week I asked you, if you had someone that you felt needed to know Christ and you would be praying for them, if you would give me their names, then I would pray with you. And I shared with you, I'd done this once before and only got five names. You've already given me 30 names this week. And people are still handing those to me. And I celebrate that. And I have those in front of me on my desk that I might pray with you for these people and I hope that you are praying for them and if you have not yet prayed and asked God for someone to share your faith with I hope you'll make that a matter of prayer but this morning when we talk about being a biblical witness the question comes back to this are you willing are you ready are you able on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about how to share Christ. And I would invite you to come even this Wednesday as we talk even more about that. You see, it's one thing to just wish to be involved. You know the old, ad the old adage about commitment, about ham and eggs, that the chicken was involved, but that the pig was committed. You know the difference, don't you? Whether we just say, I I'll do a little bit, I might pray about this, or whether we give our very lives to the one who gave his life for us. Be biblical. Share your faith by sharing the word of God. This morning as we've looked at God's Word and how one might become a Christian, perhaps there's one here this morning that has not confessed Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe God is calling you. Maybe you feel the Spirit 
pulling upon your heart. Would you come this morning, confess Christ, and be baptized in the fellowship of this church? Maybe there are already those who are Christians, but you need a church home. We invite you to come at this time and to join with this church family known as First Baptist. If God is leading you, would you come as we sing our hymn of commitment? you pray with me? God has given us a great gift, and God has given us his word, both the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the written word, our Holy Scripture. Delve deep into both. Go and share the word of God this week to all who need to hear in Christ's name. Amen.